Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. Hey, Doom Baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show presented by Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me, the two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, a member of the 1986 world champion New York Mets, the number one best-selling author, and also the voice of his memoir, Gibby, Tales of a Baseball Lifer, available everywhere. Joining us back from Canada and direct from the Lone Star State, the man who always tells it like it is, the baseball life himself, John Gibbons. Gibby, how was your trip up there to Canada once again? I believe you were in Lloyd Minster this time. Yeah, you know, it had, it had never been out that way, but it was out, out in the West. You know, I love it out West. And we I flew into Edmonton, then we, then we drove a couple hours, had a blast. Uh, and then, I, of course, I left uh, like about 110 degrees down here and I got out. I think we walked out in the mornings and it was like 60s in the 60s. I'm going, now this is nice, right? So now I'm back in this, I'm back in this inferno. You know, but I had a blast. Uh, people out there are so good. Yeah, it's a whole different dynamic. And, of course, the weather plays uh, into a positive part of it. And then you have to go back to Texas, and it's still sweltering down there. So, uh, well, welcome back, uh, John. Another trip, another successful trip up there. And uh, exciting week for the Blue Jays. They were winners of three series in a row. Now they're in the middle of the biggest homestand of the year. We'll discuss it all today on the show. Plus, we have a great gabbing with Gibby today, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Dan Schulman, the play-by-play voice for the Jays, will join us. And inspired by our friends at Miller Lite, we'll have our weekly roast and toast. Uh, but Gibby, let's get right to the leadoff. As I said, the Jays are in the middle of their biggest homestand of the season. Uh, since uh, our last show, the Jays did what they had to do against those teams that were below 500. They won. They went 10 and 5 in their last four series. Uh, they're in the wild card. Uh, they are holding on by a thread now after the loss last night to the Texas Rangers. Uh, this is a big series, Gibby. And uh, last night, it was not a, a good way to start it. Uh, it was a blowout. Texas roughing up uh, Chris Bassett and the Jays bullpen. They won 10 to four. The Jays have to win the remaining three games of the series to have the season advantage against the Rangers in case of a tie with Texas at the end of the season. However, it was an ugly loss last night. Chris Bassett, who had come off two brilliant eight inning outings, had a quick first inning, but then some pitch cotton issues again. And then in the second, Mitch Garver opened up with a walk. He went to second on a single. Uh, He wound up on third base, and he was going up and down the the line. Bassett gets distraction and then runs after him, and then that uh, results in a uh, a violation, a balk, uh, leading to the first run. Give me the question for you regarding Bassett and last night. It's September. It's not April anymore. Shouldn't these pitch com issues have been worked out? Shouldn't it be a non-issue by now with Bassett? Yeah, I mean, I, I have no idea what happened. Uh, other than, yeah, because it, he, you know, it was, it was an issue for him early in the season, and then they ironed it out, and and, and something happened here. I don't know. I, I didn't hear an explanation on it. Yeah, that's they've been using it too long, you know. So I'd, I'd like to know the explanation on it, but uh, yeah. Anyway. You know, he, he's been so good for this team. He's coming off a uh, couple of really nice outings. You know, it's, it was su- it's, it's such a big series for him, but you know what? He's, he's human, and you know what? Texas got a pretty good offense. It was one of those nights for him. I would definitely yeah. wouldn't write him off, though. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, what a stable guy, and he's very focused uh, most of the time. But that pitch comp thing has been uh, a bugaboo for him uh, since the beginning of the season. Uh, the other question I got is uh, uh, John Schneider left Bassett in to start the sixth inning uh, when Chris clearly was not on top of his game, uh, given up three runs in the first five innings and two more in the sixth before Schneider takes him out. Uh, Schneider's been kind of quick to uh, pull guys uh, this season, Ryu, uh, Barrios, I mean, others, uh, but he leaves Bassett in when Bassett uh, clearly wasn't on top of his game. Did he leave uh, Chris in maybe too long last night? Well, I mean, that's hard to say. I, 
he's been kind of his go-to, his steady guy, you know, him and Gosman, right? They, they chew up innings. He, he, he's proved to him, you know, he can pitch later in the game. You know, he starts chalking up some pitches. The game, this game was still manageable right there when he was in. And, uh, you know, you got to remember, too, when, in, uh, mm-hmm. analytics might say do this, do that, but certain guys will go out and prove, prove otherwise to you, you know, that they're capable of certain things, and I think that's important, right? He's also, you also got to remember they, they got it's a four game series. You know, Toronto's got the best bullpen, but you don't want to, especially when you're down, let's say early on, necessarily burn through those guys in day one because you got, you, you figure you're going to be using them a lot, you know, for four straight games, right? It's going to be, they should be those kind of games. And here you got a guy that throws a lot of innings every night. You, you leave him in there, see if he can work his way through some things, and you keep those guys rested. If you're down, you bring in one of your, your, your pitchers you use when you're down, your bullpen guys. Uh, yeah, I don't. Th- I don't think it was anything more than, you know, you had faith in the guy, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you have a you have three big games to go, um, but there's one thing that you're really familiar with, John, and that's the Texas Rangers. I mean, the history of these two franchises is certainly well known. The faces may have changed uh, since you managed the team, but history has a long memory. Aside from the obvious importance of this series. Does the disdain of the past between the Rangers and the Jays remain to this day? You know, John, I, I don't think so, you know, because, because there's nobody around, you know, that, uh, you know, you're talking about 215 and 16, we, and we, and we had those battles with them. Um, it might be a Texas-Canada thing more than anything, right? <laughs> you, you know what? Uh, even even the coaching staffs, other than maybe, you know, Pete Walker and, and – uh, Louie over to third base, that, that's all changed. And the Rangers have a whole new staff. I don't know. You know, you build those. It's, uh, I don't think it ever got to the top, like the Red Sox Yankees. That's a, that's a historic rivalry, right? This, it is. This, this one flared up, you know, in, in, you know, back, back, what, how many years ago? Six, seven, eight years ago. So, uh, yeah. If there was, if there was, if there was, uh, a lot of, a lot of people still involved that, the, heck, even the front offices are different, right? For the most part, you know, Texas and, uh, but you know what? Bottom line is two good teams again. It's just like back when I was there, they had two really good powerhouse teams playing each other, right? Same thing now. Two really good teams. You know, it, it's going to – I'll put it this way. If they both get in the playoffs, I'll put my money on the Blue Jays because of history. Yeah. But they, it really, really, it's just two good teams going at it, very similar teams too. Yeah, the um, you know the the Jays did what they had to do, as I mentioned, uh, by uh, uh, beating up on some of the lesser clubs. Um, in your opinion, are they playing better, or that they just beat up on teams they had to beat up on? And now they have the big test facing Texas, Boston, New York, Tampa Bay. So, uh, what's the team that we're looking at? Is it the team that beat up on the uh, the lesser teams, or uh, a team that now has to really compete for their playoff berth? Well, now we're going to find out. That, that's for sure. You know, they, uh, you know, gets as, as the season gets near the end and you're you're battling for one of those spots. You know, and it, get, it gets tough to win when you got to win. But but you know, as far as the uh, the teams they've been playing, they just they just played them all at once when they're all bunched up together because every other team, you know, the Rangers, the Astros, the Tampa Bay Rays, went. They've all played the same teams, you know, and that's the beauty. I think that with uh, the one thing that. Major League Baseball did right a little more balanced schedule. It's not completely balanced, but it's it's it, it's close. So that's how you get a true read on a wild card, you know. Um, but there's no doubt when you go down to the end of the year, you play your teams in your own division, it gets tougher. They know each other. You know, the, the they, they got the Yankees, the Red Sox. The Red Sox could swing it with the best of them. They, they don't have enough pitching. The Yankees are scuffling, but Tampa's still there. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a battle. But same thing for the Texas Rangers and the Seattle Mariners. You know, they're they're facing it off numerous times. Yeah, it's gonna be a great finish. Let's put it that way. This could be a very exciting finish for sure. Uh, an exciting game, although a weird game, was this past Sunday uh, with the young uh, Kansas City starter Cole Reagans, who really you know, was shutting the Blue Jays down. And then all of a sudden, you know, he lost his footing on the mound. He fell down. He uh, three wild pitches in a row, which resulted in the Jays winning the game, uh, uh, winning the game, but they tied the game at that point. But I'd never seen that before ever, like a pitcher, like three, four times in a row, just like losing his footing and the, and falling down 
so he was removed from the game. The, uh, Kevin Kiermeyer hit a go-ahead home run, uh, which turned him to the game winner. And then something really interesting happened at the end of that game. Uh, Arden Zwelling was about to interview Kiermeyer, but Kevin grabbed the mic from him and yelled to the crowd that there's three weeks left to the season and that they've been playing for October all year, and we're going to go in it. We're, we're okay. We're doing it. And the crowd went wild, and Vladdy comes out and throws the bucket of water on his head. Uh, but, I mean, you know, after a sweep of a team that just lost its 100th game that day, uh, was that a little too exuberant, or was it kind of poking at the baseball gods? As a manager, John, what do you think of uh, of that – little performance at the end of Sunday's game. <laughs> and we're going to find out, man, whether it worked or not, or whether the baseball guys are pissed off or, you know what? I'm a, maybe an old fuddy duddy now, you know, I'm not over the hill yet, but I'm getting, old. you know, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in the game now. that drive me nuts, right. You know, whether it's Seattle Mariners with their try trident and, you know, you name it, everybody, the helmets, whatever, you know, that kind of stuff drives me, you know, especially when teams stink. Right. Um, so, but I think, the whole idea in Major League Baseball now is is to uh, bring on the young fans and, you know, so whatever you do to rev them up, sometimes the stupider, the better and all that, they they encourage that, right? That's kind of the world we live in now. Now, as far as Kevin uh, Kiermaier, Kevin's one of the most uh, upbeat, exciting guys. I'm still, still, I was still a little bit, a little bit surprised by it, but he's probably, he's probably gauging the, the atmosphere and the, and the feeling that, that the team's getting with their fan base. Yeah. There, there, there's panic setting in this and that, and he was maybe just trying to calm them down. Yeah. Would I have done it? Heck no. Do I think uh, Donaldson or Batista would have ever done it? Probably not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hey, but the bottom line, hey, just, just this team, I still believe this, and I'll say this till the end, is, is they just got to get in. They got they got the pitching staff to, to go all the way, and uh, you, know, you got to have confidence. Yeah, in a short series uh, pitching, and especially how deep, the Jays pitching staff is uh, they get in, they got a really good shot. You are listening to the Gibby show presented by our friends at Miller light. Uh, it's Miller time at Chuck's roadhouse this month. Look for the Miller light feature at Chuck's during September and enter for your chance to win a trip for two to a world series game. John, uh, I mean, this is a really exciting contest for everybody out there. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a world series game? Yeah, it is. It, it, you know, yeah, you couldn't have. I don't, I've, I've never seen a better contest, right? And you know, the the enthusiasm and the excitement in Major League Baseball now is is at a pretty good high. You know, yeah. so in the with the wild the extra wild cards. I mean, there's so many teams that still engaged. The fan bases are crazy, and and, the, and really, a lot, so many things up for grabs. Any fan base could end up in the World Series. Really, a lot, a lot of them, anyway. Uh, so I, th- I think yeah, I think it was a brilliant idea, you know, and get a chance to go to World Series. Yeah, and I, w- I, w- I was in the '86 World Series with the Mets at- catching in the bullpen. I've never been, never, never attended one sitting in the stands, and uh, I would love to someday. Hey, what an '86 series that was! I just watched the thirty for thirty four part special uh, on the '86 Mets again, and it brings you back. I was at every one of those games myself personally, and uh, it was exciting. So getting to go see a World Series is one of the most exciting things anyone can ever do. All you got to do is go to www.millerlight.ca forward slash 2023 World Series Contest for more information. Nothing goes better with baseball than Miller Lite, the official beer of the MLB. Yeah, baby. Corner booths, sticky floors. Weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, John, uh, reports indicate that Alec Manoa's season is over. Manoa got further medical testing done last week, meeting with uh, multiple specialists to determine the severity of the wear and tear to his knees, right quad. There were no, there was no structural damage, uh, but he has been shut down. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, John, as a manager, someone who's been in the dugout when you have a player who's injured, uh, who was a big part of the team. With Manoa, do you think the Jays – 
should bring him back to Toronto so at least he feels like he's part of the team, even though he won't be pitching. Would that be good for the team, or would Manoa uh, be a distraction that would hinder the team? Yeah, no, I don't think he'd be a distraction. I think those guys love him. You know, I, I, you know, I don't sense anything else. And you know, you, you know, he was so good last year, and he got to help get him to the playoffs, right? And uh, and this year it's been a battle for him, but he's been he's been in the trenches with those guys, and yeah. And even though he won't be on the active playoff roster, I mean, I remember Mark Burley went on one of our playoff rosters, but he was in the dugout. Uh, and we. we those guys that are part of the team, they, they they hang around, you know, in uniform and all that because they are part of the team. And that's important. You tell those guys to go home. I guess you could at least give them the option. But if you told them, you know, you can't sit on there, you, you want to you want to stir a hornet's nest. That's that's yeah. that's how you do it right there. Yeah. And he'd be a, a good cheerleader for the guys. And yeah. His teammates. So, uh, yeah. And you I mean, know what? He's uh, going to be a good he's going to be a good pitcher for him down the road, yeah. too. You know, I think this is. He'll, hopefully this gets this is all behind him starting next year and, and he gets back on track and uh you know it's it's a tough game it is it's tough to stay on top and he's a young kid you know yeah. but hey you you're gonna need him and you better support him because he's been a he's been a big uh, supporter or big uh big yeah well we cer- we certainly hope twenty twenty four is gonna be a huge uh, comeback year for Alec Manoa. That's going to wrap up the leadoff. Now it's time for Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Twist up your snack time with Tim's savory twist, served warm in four cheese or everything seasoning. They're a buttery and flaky pastry, freshly baked throughout the day. Snack and go with Tim's new savory twist today. Uh, Gibby, I know you had the chance to visit Tim's while in Canada, like you always do when you're up there. Was uh, Tim's Savory Twist part of your visit? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? It, it, we're, I was in Lloyd Minster in, in uh, you know, I think there's three or four minutes. It's a small little town. This one I went was Bob, man. You know, it's like, hey, I got to wait in line. You know, I mean, so, that's, so it's not only do I enjoy it, everybody's enjoying it, but, you know, that's that's like automatic. I'm in Canada. <laughs> First stop. I got got to go. I got to go. Today on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, we welcome one of the best play-by-play announcers in the game, along with his partner, Buck Martinez. He's the voice of the Jays TV broadcast. He's had a storied career as an announcer, lead announcer for ESPN's men's college basketball game, and previously called regular and postseason Major League Baseball on ESPN and ESPN Radio. Joining us today, let's welcome Dan Schulman. Dan, welcome to Gabbing with Gibby. John, Gibby, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, Gibby, it's good to see you. It's been too long, my friend. I know, Dan. Hey, but hey, I check you out, though, man. You know what? It, uh, you know, there's nobody better in the business, you know. Uh, there really isn't. So I, Thank you. you know, there, but there's a lot of guys out there, you know, I, I – you know, when I watch games, I like to listen to them. There's get like a lot of guys I don't, but you're one of those guys that, you know, you, you tell the story, you know, you don't get crazy emotional like some of these guys now. And it's like, like the all time great, you know, and, it, and I, I can remember Mike Shaw, who's our, our traveling secretary. The first time I heard you when we started we're doing our games, I said, who is that guy? I said, I said, look how smooth he is, man. He's soothing, man. You listen, you listen to the game and it's like, anyway. So we appreciate you coming on the show because you know it's that it's that time of year things are getting are heating up in the, in the baseball yeah. world. We appreciate you taking some time. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to see you, and you're right. It's uh, it's exciting up here right now. Uh, the Blue Jays are in a fight for their playoff lives. But um, I remember when I came back uh, to the Blue Jays in 2016. I didn't do all that many games. I wish I'd done more. You and I could have spent some time together and had a few pops together and shared some stories. Oh. I think. But. <laughs> I, re- I remember the first time I walked into your office and and introduced myself and and you know you uh, and you were kind enough to say sit down and we talked for a while and um, it, it was great. I've been very fortunate. I've been very lucky to do a lot of great stuff at ESPN that I've uh, that I'll always remember. And you know I'm a Toronto boy, right? So being able to call games for your hometown team too, I think I've kind of had the best of both worlds. Yes, you have. But you know you've earned every every bit of it. You know, in, in uh, it, it, hey, you got to be good to get to where you're at. So that's the bottom line, right? Appreciate it. Uh, Johnny, what do you got for Dan? Uh, Dan, I mean, pleasure to see you, meet you, and uh, talk to you. Of course, the Jays are, as you said, in the middle of uh, 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 their playoff lives right now, 
on the line. They're playing Texas right now this week, and uh, their run against the uh, lower tier teams is over. But looking at the makeup of the Jays right now and how well they did against those uh, 500 or sub 500 teams and now going up against teams that are in it like Texas, uh, what stands out to you as we head into the final few weeks of the season with the Blue Jays? I think it's going to be uh, amazingly stressful for the fan base over the next two and a half weeks, you know. I mean, last year they barely got in, got knocked out in the first round. The year before, they got eliminated on the last day of the season. Um, this is how they do it, unfortunately. They don't make it easy on themselves. They're a good team. I mean, you're 16 games over 500 in this division, in the American League East. You're having a good year. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, and, and I include the organization and the players in this, feel they should have a few more wins. It took them a while for the bats really to get going. And the huge story up here, and we, you, you couldn't avoid it. You couldn't avoid it in the fan base, on the air with us, whatever, was the runners in scoring position thing. Like, they got men on. They just couldn't cash them in. That has corrected the last five, six weeks. They've done a much better job. But they've put themselves in this situation where they don't have enough wins that they can kind of glide into the postseason. They're going to have to beat out either Seattle or Texas to do it. So, the best thing they can do is beat the Texas Rangers over the next three nights. And they lost to them last night. So they're only a half game ahead of them. Uh, unless they win the next three against Texas, Texas will have the tiebreaker against them. Seattle has the tiebreaker against them. The Blue Jays have the tiebreaker against Houston, but I don't know if Houston's going to be the team they're going to wind up being closest to. So the pitching, by and large, has been great. Um, they've been first or second in the in the majors in ERA for weeks on end now. They just got a hit. And, and Gibby, this this isn't like 2015, 2016, or 2021. I mean, you, you know, you had that great offensive group with Bautista and Donaldson and Encarnacion and the rest. And, and even a couple of years ago and last year, the Blue Jays hit like crazy. It just hasn't all come together this year. The pitching's really good. The defense is really good. Um, the offense has done better of late, but it's going to have to take it up another notch or two, I think, in the last three weeks for them to make the playoffs. Yeah, well, you know, I saw I was reading something the other day about you're right. The this especially this rat last road trip, they're starting to come through with guys in scoring position. And you know, yeah. And it that's always the number one thing where everybody looks to when you, when your team struggle, what what you hit with runners in scoring position. And this goes back to well, RBIs don't matter, this and that, but which is wrong because some guys <laughs> drive in, some guys don't. But that that was the key, you know, because they've got the best. I think they've got the best pitch in, in the in the game when you look at their starting rotation and in, in their bullpen. Who's better? And that's what's gonna. If they get in, which I, I have a hard time believing they can't get in, right? I think they're just too good for that. That's what's gonna carry them, and, and they could they could run it. They they could go all the way because they have the pitching, you know, and under the gun pressure situations. You, you agree with that? I agree with that hundred percent. I mean, Kevin Gosman is an ace. You put him up against anybody's number one. And I don't care what order you go, two, three, four, whether it's Barrios, Bassett, Kikuchi, or Kikuchi, Bassett, Barrios. I mean, these are good problems to have. Yeah. You know, Hyunjin Ryu, probably just because he's coming off the IL after Tommy John surgery, and he's kind of been a five-inning guy, he's got an ERA of like 265 in seven starts, and he's probably their number five starter and might not even be on a playoff roster if they make the postseason. The bullpen is really really good. Jordan Romano is a very good closer. They bring in Jordan Hicks. They've got Tim Meza and Yenesis Cabrera from the left side. Cabrera had his worst outing as Blue Jay last night, but other than that, he's been great. They've got Eric Swanson. They've got Chad Green now, who has gotten so many big yeah. outs over the years for the Yankees. Like, and on and on and on. I mean, they've just they've got excellent pitching. One thing that they do have going for them, which is not in their control, but Texas and Seattle still have seven games left against one another so somebody's got to lose every night so right. if you're the Blue Jays and you can just go for you know if you can win more than you can lose you're gonna you're gonna gain on one of those two teams but if they're gonna do it they're gonna have to do it against teams in their own division their last 15 three against Boston six against the Yankees six against the Rays and Gibby you know better than me I know Boston's not in it and I know the Yankees are not in it but it's still the Red Sox and the Yankees. They still got to go to the Bronx and play well there next week. Um, you know, they, they've they just got to find a way. It's it's 144 games into the season, and, and there's been so much, well, look at the talent and on paper, and they should, and it's got to get past that. Now they've, gotta, they've just got to go out and in these last 18 games find a way to win enough of them, whether that means 10 or 11 or 12. 
Uh, right. I don't know. They got to win more than they lose over the last 18 games. Hey, isn't it weird though? You look at, you see that the two bottom teams, it's New York and Boston, right? Yeah. Historically in this division, it's like, yeah, what, what, what happened? I think Boston's trying to run their team like a small market now though. You know, you yeah, know I mean? think they're kind of, they're not rebuilding. They're kind of trying to do both at one, you know, stay in it, but retool and, um, which is which is hard to do in this division. They actually had a little bit better of a season, I think, than a lot of people thought. I think most yeah. people thought they'd be in last, and they might. They're only a couple games ahead of the Yankees. But you're right. Like, how often does it happen in the American League East where both the Yankees and Red Sox are down? Like that just that just doesn't happen. And in that kind of a season, you got to take advantage. And you know, again, the Blue Jays have been good. Like they're they've won. Uh, you know, I think 91, 90, and then 91, and then 90, and they're probably going to be right around there. Like three yeah. years in a row, it's hard to win 90 games in the American League East. The schedule is more balanced, but it's not totally balanced. They're still playing teams in their own division more than team more than the, they play the teams outside. Um, but that's why this year is so important. Like this is the fifth year for Bichette and Guerrero. Fourth full season, but fifth year. They were up for a good chunk of 2019. They've made the playoffs twice, but they haven't even won a, one playoff game yet, never mind a series. And it's it just feels – I don't want to say like the window is closing because that's a cliche, but you know what I mean. It's been yeah. – th this is year five, and those are tremendous players, you know. And uh, it just feels like they're it, – it's, it's really, really important for them to find a way to break through. And whatever that means, I don't know, but obviously get into the playoffs. If they don't, that's a huge disappointment. And then figure out a way to win a round or two at least. And uh, the fans are just dying for it. Like, you know what it was like here. Oh, You know, the price trade and the Tulowitzki trade. And then it was like Mardi Gras for the next two months. Uh, in, yeah. Uh, right? And the fans, you know, you've been to Seattle. You know the fans there and in Minnesota and Cleveland. And there are so many wonderful Blue Jay fans. And they're just dying for this team to figure it out. So I, I hope they do. Hey, hey, they're not turning into the Leafs, are they, for crying out loud? Uh, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> hey, the Leafs did win a round, at least. They won That's one right. But considering their last Stanley Cup was the year I was born, they're due, I think. So, yeah. I think you know, you know what, you know when the Leafs Leafs run into trouble when their best player, I guess he's considered the uh, is, is an American kid. That's when you got problems. If, you, if you're the Maple Leafs, your best player is not a Canadian kid, that's probably the kiss <laughs> of death. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't touch that. He's a great, 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 great. great oh, player. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. And, Go ahead, and, Johnny. and the Blue Jays even have a great Canadian, like Jordan Romano's a great Canadian, a good market. Oh, right? So uh, yeah. they took, and, and and a lot of people don't know this. I'm sure you guys do. Vladdy was born in Montreal. Vladdy's Vladdy was born oh, in yeah. too. So oh, yeah. Um, but they you know, they're a good group. They really are. And they've got kids, they've got veterans. Some of these kids who have come up from the minors, and they're a little maybe I even shouldn't call them kids. Um, Davis Schneider, Spencer Horowitz, Ernie Clement, the guys who have come up. They've got two things in common. One, they're all older than Vladdy. Vladdy is still the youngest player. Is on that the right? Team. Isn't that crazy? I'll Vladdy is the youngest player on the 26-man roster right now. But um, the other guys have really helped. They've brought a nice positive energy, uh, kind of a different vibe. I think when the team was struggling a few weeks ago, and they had a lot of they have a lot of you know older players, guys in their early to mid 30s. Some of them are on one year deals or the last year of their contracts. It, it there were a few days I walked into the clubhouse and I went, ooh, vibes a little different in here today. But since Schneider and Clement and Horowitz have come up and they've all done well, you got to do well. They've given them a nice boost because you know Bichette was on the IL, Chapman is on the IL, Jansen is on the IL. Belt got two at bats last night and then had to come out of the game again. So he hasn't really played in 10 days. They're missing some key guys. So they need what these kids are giving them. Are you kidding me with David Schneider? I mean, he's like, it's like a, Davis. He's like, it's like historic, you know, and he's like, it's the, unbelievable. And, and I describe him and, and, and I don't claim to have thought it is somebody, somebody just, just said to me, he's got like Dan Ugla's physique. Remember Dan Ugla? Stockton yeah. That's great call. Yeah. David yeah. Schneider's like Dan Ugla with a mustache is what he is right now. And he, but he's got such a good idea, Gibby, of what he wants to do with the plate. His approach is so good. He's not up there just wailing. I, I mean, right. when he swings, he's wailing, but he's got an excellent eye. He's drawn, I think 20 walks in 24 games. That's incredible for a rookie. Oh. Um, and teams are starting to, you know, whether it's the fastball up or, or keeping the ball away, most of his damage has been middle in and he'll have to make adjustments like everybody. 
and he's not going to hit, you know, 370 with 50 homers over a full season or or anything like that. But uh terrific guy, terrific young guy. Enjoy yeah. talking to him. And he has changed the look of the op. I mean, he's hitting cleanup a lot or fifth. He's let off. He's hit second. You know, he's hit all over the place. And he's kind of, you know, there was a time when it was like, boy, can they get him in the lineup? It's, and now it's like, can they keep him out of the lineup? Like the way they're they're looking for offense, you got to play this guy every day. Oh, you better play him, I tell you what. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, I got a couple uh, uh, questions about uh, and your opinion on what's going on right now. Alec Manoa, the saga continues. It appears that he's been uh, shut down for the remainder of the season. And everybody is really curious to know what's happening with him and how the Jays are kind of communicating with the media on his progress or lack thereof. Uh, have you learned anything new about Alec? Uh, is there a possible rift maybe between Manoa's camp and Jay's front office because of his recent demotion? Yeah, so I, I, I'd i love to tell you more. I don't want to claim to know more than I do. I, I don't know much at all firsthand what we do know without a doubt is when they sent him down to the minors for the second time which was i guess four or five weeks ago now he didn't immediately report and john schneider when he was asked about it and gibby you've been there where the media comes in the office and and you do the pregame stuff although the conversations in gibby's office would veer off into all kinds of other topics sometimes when we were <laughs> sitting in gibby's office <laughs> it would yeah sometimes it would get into politics and people would go back and forth and then everybody would call a timeout we'd get back to baseball but um when schneider's been asked about it you know he has said on the record uh back when he was uh, this a couple of weeks ago now he would say alec is not in buffalo yet he's still in toronto we're working through the process it was, it was kind of vague. And, and, you know, he has a right to keep it vague. I don't know what it is. So he has a right to keep it vague if that's what the organization is trying to figure its way through or trying to sort out. It has been reported that there were some medical tests done. If, if you kind of put all the little pieces together, it sounds like Manoa or Manoa's camp, you know, his agent, his advisors or everybody, that they were upset when he was sent down for the second time. And I don't want to say that he refused to report. I don't know if that's true, but we know he didn't report for a couple of weeks. Then he did go to Buffalo, but he didn't start pitching and he's never started pitching. And then a few days ago, they put him on, I think it's called the temporary inactive list or something like that, which was really just a procedural move to open up a roster spot in Buffalo to get somebody else on there. So you you asked if there's a possible rift. I mean, again, I don't have firsthand knowledge, but it sure seems like these aren't the best of times right now. Um, and whatever it is, uh, I just hope that both sides can find their way through it. I hope for Alec Manoa that he can find his way through it. I don't know, Gibby, yeah. if if you've had him on the podcast or not. I'm not sure. But, you know, I've yeah. had some wonderful conversations with Alec Manoa. He's got yeah. a, huge heart, a huge heart and a lot of ability. He was a Cy Young finalist last year. Um, and it's obviously been a disastrous season for him, a lost season for him. So uh, I don't know what the offseason brings. I, I really don't. Um, you know, whether there are health issues, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't even want to throw words out there because they're, yeah. you know, it's not for me to speculate. But um, it, it's it doesn't feel like it's a great situation. And if there is a rift, I hope they can mend it. I hope he can spend some time in Dunedin in the winter and put himself back together in every way as best he can. But at this point, they've got four star, like four big time, big name, big money starters for next year. So, you know, I think he's looking at competing for a spot on the rotation. I think that's where it is right now. Um, but I hope he still wants to be in Toronto. I hope physically and mentally he is able to hopefully get back to where he was last year and the year before because you add an out, you add a good Alec Manoa to this team. You got an unbelievable pitching staff. So, yeah. um, you know what? It's the details will come out eventually, I guess. But a lot of it is being kept behind closed doors right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's a, uh, it's almost like his agents must have got involved. He, I would, I would guess. You know, I don't know anything either. You know, I can't even get Pete Walker to talk for crying out loud. But it's it's uh, he must have been hanging a little bit or say, well, you can't send him down because it's costing you money, service time. You know how all that works. Right. We've dealt with that with so many different guys. Yeah. And his agents might have said, hey, wait a minute. You know what? There's two months left in the season or a month left in the season, whatever. 
ride it out. You never know. I mean, a lot of that kind of stuff goes on. So, but yeah, we had him on the show last fall when he was in the middle of the, you know, the Cy Young chase and all that. Tremendous kid in in mm-hmm. that. But it just shows you how tough this game is, you know, to ma- yeah. and maintain it year after year. That's why the guys, the superstars in the game that do it every year, they're special guys, you know. It's yeah. like it's not that easy, you know. No. Well, even a guy like Vladdy, who's as talented as anybody, he has the year he has in 2021. And now the expectation is do it again, do it again, do it again. And he's had two good years since then, but not right. the kind of numbers that a guy of his talent that, you know, we you hope to see from a guy of his town. But, you know, look at Trey Turner this year. He had a miserable first half, and now he's like the best hitter in baseball in, in the second half. It, it is the guys who put up the consistent numbers year after year after year. They may not be the flashiest guys in the world, but, uh, I mean, I'll defer to you on this, Gibby. I, I think managers like consistency sometimes more than anything else because at least when you write that guy's name in the lineup, you know what you're going to get from him. And, and it, it, it's hard to find those guys. So, and, and you know who's like that? Bo Bichette's like that. Bo Bichette is amazingly yeah. consistent, works his tail off, and mentally is driven to be the best player on the field. You know, a little bit of a – I don't even want to say chip on his shoulder. I think he's just driven to be the best player – on the field and works and works and works. And if you told me 15 years from now, Bo Bichette retired with 3,000 hits and went into the Hall of Fame, I wouldn't scoff at that. I, I think I agree. I think he is wound that way to wake up every day saying, I'm going to go to the ballpark and be the best player on the diamond today. I think that's the only way he knows how to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons he's so good. Yeah, no, he doesn't need a lot of fanfare. He's not into that. That's my impression. He just uh, he's no. he's just go just throw him out there, and he's got the best hair in the league. That's... <laughs> Don't yeah, cut it, maybe Samson cut his hair. So yeah, I think. But <laughs> and, and I promise you this: we're never going to show up at the ballpark one day and go, "Oh, look, Bo cut his hair." That ain't happening. He likes <laughs> his hair a lot. Yeah. Fabio. Uh... <laughs> Add a twist to snack time with Tim's new savory twists. They're a buttery and flaky pastry served warm in four cheese or everything seasoning. So you can enjoy a quick and tasty snack break anytime. Mm -hmm. Try Tim's new savory twists today. Uh, Got a couple of questions about your career. Obviously, what a storied career you've had. Um, This is kind of a two-parter and I got a follow-up for you, Dan. Um, What was your most memorable call as a Blue Jays announcer? And then maybe your most memorable call of your career in general? So there, it's a good question. And I've been so fortunate again, between working for the Blue Jays uh, or calling Blue Jays games. I did it back in the mid to late nineties, right after the the two uh, world series years. And then I went full-time to ESPN for many years and now I've come back. The funny thing is my most memorable moments calling a Blue Jay game was not calling it for Sportsnet or TSN or anybody in Canada. Uh, I happened to be on the bat flip game for ESPN radio. One of the the great pleasures of my career has been uh, calling the playoffs for ESPN radio for 28 years. This is actually the first year that I'm not going to do that. And uh, I was on the Cub Cardinals series that year. And I think the Cardinals won. And my boss called me and he said, "Um, what are you doing? I said, I'm going home tomorrow. I'm going to game five. I got tickets to game five. He said, we got a problem. We had to move some announcers around. Can you call the game? And I said, sure. So they kind of parachuted me in to do game five of that series. Rick Sutcliffe and I called game five of that series for ESPN radio. And nobody in Canada knows it because in Canada, they either heard the US TV call or they heard Jerry Howard's call on the radio. My call was heard on the radio all through the US. But to be in the ballpark in that moment for that game and the seventh inning of that, I don't know about you, Gibby, the seventh inning of that game is the single most unbelievable electric atmosphere I've ever been in in my life in, in any sporting event. So um, that's one of them. Um, I've never, you, you know, so during the, uh, when I do the games, John, on TV, uh, those are just regular season games, except uh, we do have the right to do some playoff games going forward. So if the Blue Jays make the playoffs, we'll continue to call the games for Sportsnet, which is awesome. But, you know, I've, I've been whether it's Canada Day or opening day. Again, I'm a Toronto boy. So um, all of those things, you know, mean mean a lot to me. But I would say the Jose Bautista bat flip. In terms of biggest, uh, so I do a lot of college basketball, as you guys probably know. And and um, I don't care if it's at Duke or North Carolina. And I don't care if they're up or they're down. It's Duke and Carolina. And yeah. doing all of those games mean mean the world to me. 
And I'll tell you something I just did that you guys might not know, but it's it's known up here. Um, I just called. I was doing double duty for a couple of weeks, doing Blue Jay games at night. And then early in the morning, I was calling FIBA basketball, the World Cup of basketball. Like think the World Cup of soccer, but basketball. Mm -hmm. Canada's got its best team ever. The games were in um, Indonesia and the Philippines. So I'm calling them off a monitor from a studio in Toronto. So I'm calling like Canada, France at 4.30 in the morning and then doing the Blue Jays uh -huh. at night at 7 o'clock. So I've discovered uh, how many coffees is too many coffees uh, during the day. Um, but Canada did great. They qualified for the Olympics. They beat France and Latvia and Spain uh, in, in a must-win game. And then they beat the United States for bronze. And by far the best showing they've ever had. And, uh, you know, I love Canada and I love basketball. So it, as um, as funny as it may sound, what I did the last couple of weeks calling those games has been about as much fun as I've ever had. Wow. That's a that's awesome. But uh, the follow up I have is kind of a historic uh, announcement. It, it was not a sports call, but on May 1st, 2011, you were in the booth uh, for the ESPN Sunday night game between the Mets and the Phillies. And a news event broke during that game. Uh, that was kind of compared to Howard Cosell's report on Monday Night Football in 1980 when he had to announce the shooting and death of John Lennon. Um, in your case, bring us back to the moment on that night, May 1st, 2011, when you learned of the death of Osama bin Laden. Yeah. And, you know, I bring this up because it's 22 years this week that 9-11 right. happened. Right. And uh, the scramble in the booth, who told you about it? And and I understand that things had to move quick for you to get it out to the public. So kind of walk us through what happened that night on May 1st, 2011. I'll give it to you as best I remember. So it was the Mets at the Phillies, Sunday Night Baseball. And I'm in the booth with Bobby Valentine and Oral Hershiser. That was the crew that year. Bobby was sitting right beside me, Oral on the other side of Bobby. And... Seventh inning, I want to say, we go to break and Bobby, or I don't even know if we were, were in break. Bobby kind of nudges me with his elbow and shows me his phone. And it's a text. I don't, I, I never saw who it was from, or I never noticed who it was from. But I do remember what the text said. And all it said was, we got Bin Laden. And I looked at Bobby and Bobby looked at me like in the games going on. And, you know. 2-1, grounded out to short over the first two down, like you're trying to call a baseball game at the same time. So I went on talkback, which for people who don't know is, is an ability for me to talk to the people in the truck without it going out over the air. Our producer is there and, and news editor and so forth. And I said, do you guys have anything on Bin Laden? And I said, Bobby just showed me a text. And they said, yes, we're trying to corroborate it. Don't say anything, just call the game. <laughs> so for the next like 60 seconds, 90 seconds, you know, there's a pop up, two down, and, and you're trying to call the game. And and then they're trying to help me out. And I think we go to break the half inning ends. We go to break and we come back out and I give a bit of a statement. And and, and to be honest with you, in hindsight, I, I, I played it in, incredibly safe. I think I could have done better. But, you know, it's 2011, but people had phones already and news is flying already. Like this wasn't like 1980 or anything like that. So we start talking about it. And of course, Bobby Valentine was the manager of the Mets uh, during 9-11 in 2001 and was very visible. And the Mets as a team were visible in front and center down at ground zero and that sort of thing. So I had a great resource for perspective sitting beside me um, in Bobby Valentine. And within two or three minutes, maybe maybe a little more, but it felt like two or three minutes, people start seeing, you know, you can see people their eyes bulging, they're looking at their phones, talking to the people beside them. And then this unbelievably large USA, USA, that chant breaks out um, at Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia. 40,000 people are now chanting USA, USA. The only people who don't know what's going on are the players who are on the field. They have no clue what's going on. Um, as, as they came off, as the defense came off the field, security guards, camera people, uh, everybody found out pretty quickly, but it sounded like, uh, almost like an Olympic hockey game where people were cheering for the United States with this unbelievably loud chant of USA, USA. So for the next while, we kind of balanced back and forth calling a baseball game and talking about this. And, and again, I, I'm not trained to talk about huge world news events that's not what what i do 
Um, so I played extremely safe. And I think in hindsight, I could have uh, done a little better. And then I got a text like the next half inning from Mike Tirico, a good friend of mine, outstanding announcer, Mike Tirico. And he said, Danny, you're on the only live. It's Sunday night baseball in May. Nothing else is happening right now. There's no football. There's no. He said, you're at the largest gathering of Americans anywhere in the world right now. There's nowhere else in the world where 40,000 Americans are sitting in the same spot. He goes, that's part of the story, too. And so and he was right. So there were a ton of crowd shots. Um, you know, our camera people are great. They actually found people with USA hockey jerseys or jackets and everybody was holding them up. And then because baseball is going to baseball, the game went like 13 innings and <laughs> we were on the air for like two more hours. Um, and it was just a surreal experience juggling back and forth, trying to lend some perspective to this. And also like the baseball, they still played the game. Right. So we had to document the game. But, you know, I just kept saying ABC is part of the Disney family, ABC and ESPN. So I just kept saying for more, go to your ABC News affiliate and that sort of thing. But it was um, it's something I'll never forget. Again, I think I could have done a little better handling it. But uh, I was just trying to quarterback the situation a little bit, throw it to the studio, give it to Bobby. Let the pictures tell the story. Oh, yeah. Call the double that just happened. You know, stuff like that. So it, it was uh, certainly a night I will I will never forget. It was really ironic. You had Bobby Valentine with you because yeah. he was so instrumental when yeah. that happened. And, you know, the the uh, and it was uh, so Chase close by as Philly. Right. Yeah. At right. Chase yeah, Stadium, so they New opened Yorkers up Chase the Stadium. Yeah, they opened yeah. up Chase Stadium as a as a place for uh, the uh, first responders and to distribute uh, the supplies. And right. what an amazing story. Uh, once I read that, Dan, I, I had to ask you about it because I, I just felt it. I just felt it was a fascinating story. And thank you so much for letting us know about that experience. Yeah, my pleasure. And, and again, the other thing I wanted to keep in mind, too, is I'm Canadian. So I wanted to be incredibly respectful and make sure I didn't say the wrong thing that would offend any American because... Um, you know, there's a, a tremendously close bond between our two countries, as 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 you know. But I was just so careful because so many people watching probably lost a loved one on 9-11, right? And and there were so many New Yorkers watching because the Mets are playing and so many New Yorkers in the crowd in Philadelphia. I, I mean, you know how it is. There were probably 10,000 Mets fans at the ballpark it, 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 on, in that, on that Sunday night in Philadelphia. So... Uh, yeah, it's not something uh, it's not something they can teach you about in school. You know, it it, it really wow. isn't. That, that's the beauty. And the um, that's I guess that's the beauty of, of live TV is you just sometimes you don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I don't do scripted stuff. I don't do tape studio events. It's just not where my career took me. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable doing the live unscripted stuff. But that night was uh, that, that was quite something. Well, Dan, hey, you couldn't offend anybody, man. You know what? So don't you worry about that. <laughs> You're a straight shooter, man. That's what everybody loves about you. But all right, we're going to let you go here in a second. But, hey, I understand your son's into broadcasting now, too, huh? He is. Yeah, how'd you hear about that? John Shannon, man. Hey, John's oh, okay. got it all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My son, Ben, is a uh, Syracuse graduate, graduated from the great Newhouse Broadcasting Program at Syracuse, and he is off to a tremendously good start. He is uh, uh, the backup radio guy for the Blue Jays. When Ben Wagner's oh. not doing the games, or if Ben fills in for me or something, then then my Ben, we got to, we got a lot of Bens around. We got a lot yeah. of Bens. Then my Ben, uh, he did about 30 games this year, and he does some pre and post game, uh, pre and post game shows on the radio network. And he, um, the Raptors G League team, which plays out of Mississauga, Ontario, up here just west of Toronto. Ben does their games in the winter as well. So I'm really proud of him. He's got a, a very bright future. He works hard. He's a nice, respectful kid, which is the most, as a dad, it's the way he handles himself that I like the best. Um, I think he's coming for my job. And and you know what? <laughs> in, in a few years, if he wants it, I, I just might let him have it. <laughs> That's right. Well, Dan, listen, hey, we, we appreciate you coming on, taking some time. You got to get to the ballpark here pretty soon. But uh, listen, there's, there's there's nobody does it better, right? Thank in, you. In, uh, and you're one of the good guys, too. And that, that matters. And, you know, as fans now, we're on the fans, John and myself, that, you know, you, you watch games and it matters who's covering the game. It matters who's talking about the game, you know, in, in the, 
That's why we enjoy it. I, like I said, I told Mike Shot, hey, God, it's so soothing, man. Everything just flows, you know? I mean, it's kind of <laughs> nice to hear. It's not like, you know. So anyway. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And I'll tell you what, if I get a college basketball game down to you in Texas, uh, we're having a Miller Light or two. How's that? Oh, oh hey, perfect. Miller. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm not a big I'm not a big basketball fan because you know, if like I if, if I couldn't play it, I don't like it, right? You know, short squatty guy that there's too much running in that. <laughs> You don't have to come to the game. We'll just meet after. No, I'm to you. I'd love to. Dan, listen, man, say hello to everybody up there for us. We I will. sure appreciate it. And, uh, you know, best of luck the rest of the way. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gibby. Great to see you. Thanks, guys. Uh, really Thank enjoyed you, Dan. Thanks. That wraps up another Gabbing with Gibby. And, John, uh, Dan was great. And what a story about uh, him announcing uh, – when we got Osama bin Laden. What a great story that was. Yeah, you know, Dan, Dan's a special guy. You know, he's, he's one of the, he's, he's just a good guy to begin with. Then he's, he's in the top of his business, you know, broadcasting games, and he's, he's very talented. You know, he, he can, I mean, he's multi sports, right? And uh, the head guy there in ESPN for the college basketball, of course, he's, he's doing his hometown team now. I just enjoy listening to him, you know, I, I really do, like, like everybody else. And, um, yeah, one of the good guys. You know, you you know, you, you you always respect guys that are really good at what they do, but then when, then when they're good people, yeah. you know, uh, you like them even more. And uh, when you're watching a game and you're hearing that play by play, a voice like Dan's, I mean, it's just it's just perfect. It, it's such a great compliment, and uh, I just love his style, his delivery, and uh, him as an announcer. I've become a huge fan over the last year, being able to listen to him. Uh, almost every game. Uh, well, you know, now, John, it's going to be time for the Roast and Toast, and it's inspired by our friends over at Miller Lite. Let's get right to the roast. And this is something you pointed out, and it was it was uh, incredible. <laughs> uh, well, let's get into it. The Seattle Mariners right-handed George Kirby gave up uh, a game-tying two-run homer this past Friday night to Tampa Bay. Uh, and for Kirby, it was his 102nd pitch, and then he's he was removed. He did a post-game interview, and after that game, he said, quote, I wish I wasn't out there for the seventh inning. I was at 90 pitches, and I didn't think I could go anymore, but it is what it is. He later admitted that he might have screwed up uh, by saying that, and uh, it was kind of funny because former Jay and legendary pitcher Roger Clemens weighed in saying that this would not fly in the old days, but unfortunately this is how players are being taught with the modern analytic era. Gibby, you know how hard it is to become a player, how tough it is once you get to the big leagues. Did you agree that Kirby deserves this week's roast? Oh, yeah. Everybody ought to be roasted. Are you kidding me with this? You know, it probably – I've never said, well, I never wanted, it, what, what an excuse, right? But, but the, in professional sports, in any, any sports, right? The fact that you admit or you shouldn't have been out there, you're blaming the, you're blaming the manager because he left you out there and all that. How about thinking of your teammates, the bullpen? They, I think they had their two top relievers that both pitched three days in a row. You yeah. know what? How about picking them up and, and getting another inning under your belt or the fact that you gave it up? That mentality right there is, is not a championship mentality. I, that may be what's happening. Seattle's hit the skids pretty good right here. They had that great August. They're hitting the skids. You know, that can't go over well. If it went over well, they got no shot, shot of winning. If yeah. other guys feel the same way, they got no shot. But uh, hopefully somebody, hopefully service get, got, got a hold of them and said, wait a minute, really? You know? All right. what do you get? He probably wants to be a five-and-dive guy. But this guy's good, too. It's not like he's yeah. like, uh, you yeah. know, he, he's uh, – we used to call those guys five and divers, man. You know, they want five innings because it guarantees them a, you know, a decision, right? And what, what if it happened under your watch? <laughs> no, I, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't even answer that because it, it, <laughs> nobody would ever do that. Those guys wanted to the – guy, guys always wanted to stay in the game. And if, if not, if they really didn't, they, were, they faked it pretty good because nobody wants to notice somebody that wants to bail, right? And you and you're bailing you're bailing on the other twenty four guys that need you, you know. And, and uh, to think that ninety pitches is your limit when you're one of the top pitchers in the game that year, uh, I don't know. It, it, it rubbed me wrong. I'm, I'm sure if it didn't rub you wrong out there in the baseball world, you know, shame on you because yeah. you, you don't you don't understand the business. There you go. Uh, well, you know, we have a 
a little bit of a better story when it comes to the toast of the week. And yes, uh, this week's toast is a story of a man who's the polar opposite to the one we just roasted. <laughs> a brand new movie just hit the theaters this past weekend, and I got to see it. It was phenomenal. The Hill tells the true life story of fellow Texan John Ricky Hill. Uh, film was based on a uh, hill. He was born with the uh, unfortunate degenerative spine disorder. He had to walk with braces on his legs, almost like Forrest Gump, if you recall that movie, uh, mm-hmm. for most of his uh, young life. But he'd go out in the backyard and he'd throw a rock up and hit it with a stick 500 times a day. Uh, came from a family of poverty, but his lifelong ambition was to become a baseball player. Every obstacle, he would not give up. Uh, He managed, in spite of the physical disabilities, to get a tryout in Texas for fame scout Red Murph. And Red is the man who discovered and signed Nolan Ryan, among others. Uh, Ricky Hill did a tryout for Red, got 12 hits. He DH'd on both teams because Red is like, I'm going to break this guy. He didn't break him. 12 hits. He then signs a contract with the Montreal Expos in 1975 and managed to play four seasons in the minors before his body finally gave out. He then had the perseverance to continue on with his life. He thought his story was fascinating. It took him 17 years to find someone in Hollywood that would be interested in telling a story he did And the movie came out this past weekend on his life story. uh, The film stars Colin Ford as Hill, Dennis Quaid uh, as Hill's preacher father, country music star Randy Hauser as a coach who inspired Hill to pursue a stream. And it features John Smoltz as well. Today, Hill is 67 years old, still in Bowie, Texas. He has nine screws in his back, a 14-inch rod, six cages that he says and jokes holds them together. He also coaches Little League and recently threw out the first pitch at a Texas Rangers game. I tell you, this week's toast goes to Ricky Hill. Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go see that movie and it's like, yeah, there, there you go. There, there's, uh, overcoming all the obstacles, right. And not giving up. And then, uh, you you tip your hat to Red Murph, giving him an opportunity, but this guy has his dreams, whether it's sports or any other kind of dreams. There's people out there that overcome the odds because they want it. Who would you rather have on the mound, him or Kirby, for crying out loud? There you go. Right? In, there in, you in go. a big, in a big moment, you tell me. Yeah. But it, you know, it. Uh, you know, we don't we don't hear about enough of the, these uh, in the news today. These 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 great stories like this, feel good stories. People overcome inspirational. It. Yeah, and uh, we we need that. So hey, we salute him, man. He's a I know you love the movie, Gibby. I know you'll love it when you get a chance to see it. It just Of course, uh, I'll get a big old box of butter popcorn with that, too. There you go. There you go. Corner booths. Sticky floors. Weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste. 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. All right, everybody. I mean, uh, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. For John Gibbons, this is John Arezzi. We'll talk more baseball with you next week. It's going to be another exciting week for the Jays. Have a great week, everybody. Let's go, Blue Jays. Let's go. Let's go.